Welcome back. I'm Dr. John Messer, and this is Understanding Your Church with Systems Thinking. Today, we're going to talk about interventions and how we plan to change our church system. In this lesson, we'll address three key components. We'll talk about the system change process, then we'll talk about the types of system interventions that exist, and then we'll talk about implementing, how we actually do that. So we're going to use a three-step change process. We're going to diagnose, we're going to identify, we're going to implement. So we diagnose our system, uh, we examine it, we model it using several things, the tools that you have used already, the iceberg and various tools. Today I'm going to teach you about the connection circle tool, which helps you identify where to start when you want to intervene in a system. Then we identify the leverage point based on our connection tool. We figure out where can we intervene, what could we do to change the system. And then we implement, we, we experiment in a sense, we test and we assess a high leverage intervention. So effective interventions are really focused on the internal factors. One of the things I see very often is people think that, you know, we have to somehow change something outside of our system. Well, you can't. You can only change your system. So when we change our system, when we intervene, we're actually changing our system to better adapt to be effective in external factors. But we're not, we're not changing anything outside of the church. Uh, changes to system structure very often include beliefs and mental models. Remember, from the iceberg model that uh, mental models are the base. They are the, they are the base level, the foundation of everything in systems thinking. So if we really want transformation, we have to talk about the level of mental models. Systems interventions are long lasting and self-sustaining. They are not quick fixes. They're not just something that you pop in there real quick and then it solves everything. We know that quick fixes tend to, re, tend to not solve the problem. Those problems recur. Um, effective interventions uh, qualitatively change the long-term pattern of performance. If you want to change the church qualitatively and in the long term, you want to make system changes, not quick fixes. And they are high leverage. High leverage means that you can apply relatively small effort expense to uh, bring a big change. Um, we sometimes think that big problems require big solutions, big, expensive, bulky. I think that's part of the reason a lot of church leaders bring in these really expensive consultants to, uh, to tell us that we have to do this huge thing. You don't. In your church system, all you need to understand is what the system is what the relationships are, and you can find a high leverage intervention that will make the change for relatively little effort, relatively little cost. So to do this, we need to understand the connection circle. So let's talk about that. The goals of using the connection circle are these. We want to identify the key factors or the variables that are influencing the problem. And then we want to identify how those variables are related. In other words, what are the causal relationships between the variables? And then we'll identify a primary leverage point. Where do we start? At what point do we actually try to make a change? And from that, then, there are some implied things we can do. We can decide our primary intervention, and then we can anticipate uh, potential unintended consequences. A connection circle identifies causal links. And so how we do that, and I'll show you a graphic in a moment, is that we list five to six key variables that are uh, influencing this problem in a circle. We think about the causal relationships, and we, we will diagram those causal relationships. A causal relationship is one factor or one variable that affects another. For example, sugar consumption in cavities. What's the causal link? Well, if you think about it, and always think in terms of the first one goes up. So if sugar consumption goes up, what happens to the incidence of cavities? Well, that also goes up. So the causal relationship or the causal link between sugar consumption and cavities is the same. It's positive. As one goes up, the other goes up. Um, and so 
for example, what's a causal link you might have noticed in your context? Those are the ways that systems thinkers address what's happening in their system. And thinking in causal links, thinking about the relationship between variables, is really what we're doing when we talk about identifying an intervention. So here's a diagram. Here, this is a connection circle, and we've listed six variables, uh, one through six. And we have drawn a, an arrow. We've connected those with an arrow showing the type of relationship. S means it's the same, O means it's opposite. So for example, variable one uh, has a causal link to variable two in that as variable one goes up, variable two goes up, it's the same. Variable two has a same relationship with variable five. Variable three, for example, has an opposite relationship with variable four. So as variable three goes up, variable four goes down. The point is that we draw all of our arrows that are identifying the causal links in uh, our diagram, noting them as same or opposite. Then we count the number of arrow tails or the ends, not the arrow heads, the, the tails, the opposite end from each variable. So with the variable with, that has the most tails, you'd say, so how would changing this variable impact the other variables? What would that do? What, what, what change would that make to the whole system? And when we're thinking in that way, what we're doing is applying one of the habits of systems thinking. We're, we're understanding the system structure because system structure is the connections between the variables. It's not the variables themselves, it's the connections. It's what are the relationships between all the variables. And in doing that, then we can identify possible leverage actions. So that's what we're doing. So we have gone through with the same variables and we have identified how many tails each variable has. And so variable one, two, three, four, five, six. And we see that variable one has four tails. That's the one that has the most. And so what that's telling us is that variable one seems to have the most causal influence on that system. Now, what we want to do when we identify that is that we want to tell a story of how variable one influences all of the other variables. You want to see it in its, in its uh, systemic uh, place. You want to see what is it doing in this system. Is it a leverage point? Is it a place where we can implement a small change to impact the rest of that system? Probably, but we'll, we'll continue and then we'll see what we can do later. So we've identified that one variable on your connection circle and you've talked through that variable and how it's connected to the other variables. And so you look to see if there's a causal loop story that's, that's uh, emerging. And a loop will be evident if your story actually ends where it began. That's a causal loop. And what we're looking at is the circular nature of complex cause and effect relationships. So let's take a look at what that means. So notice variable one has the same relationship with variable two. Variable two has the same relationship with variable five. And variable five has the same relation, relationship with variable one. So as variable one goes up, variable two goes up. As variable two goes up, variable five goes up. And as five goes up, one goes up. So this is a reinforcing loop, one, two, and five. And that's important because you wanna understand those loops as they operate in your system. They're all related in the same way. And so it's important to be able to understand that that's the way your system is functioning. That is your structure. So now that we have an idea of the structure and we've seen the causal links, what can we do to intervene in a system? So here are system interventions. There are lots of places to intervene in a system. Some are more powerful than others. But uh, for example, these generic things, you can regulate negative feedback loops. You can drive positive feedback loops. You can affect information flows. 
you can deal with the rules of the system, you can impact the power over the system, the bylaws, constitution, the leadership of the system. You can deal with the goals of the system, like the mission outcomes or the vision of the system. And most importantly, remember, you can deal with the mindset or the mental models, the paradigms of the system out of which the system arises. And, and again, remember, mental models are the level of transformation of a system because from mental models comes a structure. Structure influences patterns. Patterns are, uh, from, are, are where events occur. So mental models or mindset and paradigms are one of the powerful interventions uh, and apply to pretty much every system intervention. So we want to diagnose our system now that we've done our, uh, our connection circle. And so we first want to identify what is our desired result? What outcome are we trying to accomplish? Because remember, your system is perfectly structured to accomplish the outcomes that you're getting. And if the outcomes that you're getting aren't what you want, then you need to change the structure of the system. And that's what we're talking about here is changing the structure of the system in order to accomplish the outcomes that you want to achieve. How will you know you've succeeded? What is it that you're trying to, to get to? Uh, you'll know you've succeeded when we do this, when we see that. Many interventions really are only indirectly geared to accomplish specific results because they're influenced by a new policy or the latest management fad, or we think we have to do this because we've always done that, or it's tradition, or it's the thing that we think people will want us to do, or in the church especially, it's the thing that people will be most comfortable with. That is not the most effective intervention strategy. Those are those are watered down, those are wishy-washy goals. It probably is not going to be direct enough. It's probably going to be uh, fuzzy and you're not going to be able to accomplish what you're talking about. So rather than assuming that we're clear on the results we want to accomplish or the outcomes we're trying to accomplish, we need to make them as clear as possible. Make them crystal clear. The more clear the outcome is, the more likely it is that you will be able to change the system to accomplish that. So specific results then can be measured in, in these ways. We can identify actual results rather than the steps or the actions needed. In other words, um, completing a discipleship program, which is more of a step, is not the same thing as personal transformation. Now, completing a discipleship program may contribute to personal transformation, but it's not the same thing. So don't substitute discipleship program for personal transformation. What we really want is personal transformation. We, can, uh, we realize that anticipated results in the positive rather than avoiding an undesired result are, are better. So in other words, increased unity and maturity in Christ is not the same as having no disagreements. If you say that we want no disagreements, that, that is a fuzzy outcome, and it's really hard to, to accomplish a negative outcome. So we are more interested in developing unity and maturity in Christ, not having no disagreements. We want to remember to include the perspectives of others uh, because uh, high leverage interventions very often are the result of a group. Um, systems thinking is really intended to be done by a group, not just one individual. And so always, always remember to incorporate the ideas and the suggestions of others. So you want to avoid fuzzy goals, fuzzy outcomes. You want them to be clear. When they're fuzzy, you're just reinforcing the idea that, you know, well, we can, we can make everybody happy. No, you're, you're going to have to be very clear. Some people may not agree with it. Some people may not like it, but you have to be clear to accomplish your system change. Here are some questions to ask as you're thinking about potential outcomes when you're looking at changing your system. Why have we been unable to solve this problem despite our best efforts? Most problems in churches have been addressed multiple times, but one of the reasons systems thinking is so powerful is that it is able to, to bring solutions to those things that keep occurring over and over and over again 
those uh, those big problems that just don't seem to go away. And another question is how might we be partly responsible, even, even if it's unwittingly, for that problem? Remember that as a church leader, we're part of the system. And so we are contributing to the problem, whether we're trying to or not. Unwittingly, unknowingly, we are in some way contributing to that problem. Well, how are we doing that? And what might be the unintended consequences of our previous attempts to solve the problem? Um, when we look at quick fix approaches to problems, very often it will recur. And not only does it recur, but it comes back bigger and badder. It's worse than it was to begin with. Uh, because one of the unintended consequences of that quick fix was that it was reinforcing the problem within the system. And so, and so the symptoms keep getting bigger and harder and worse than they were to begin with. What are those? The other thing, think about the payoffs of your current system. In every church system, there are payoffs to the way the church system is operating. The payoffs are not always positive, but what group, what individual, what ministry is getting a payoff for the church to operate in the way that it is? Very often, if you can identify what those payoffs are, you can find what the, what the real systemic structure is and why it is resisting change. And finally, you need to think about what you might have to give up for the whole to succeed. Uh, every system intervention is going to require some sort of sacrifice. People are going to lose something. They're going to lose their comfort. They're going to lose their convenience. They're going to lose their familiarity or their sense of contentment with the way things are. Um, but what are you going to have to give up? Think about that. Those are important things to know in advance before you start changing the system. So our interventions are potentially delays, uh, negative feedback loops, positive feedback loops, information flows, mental models. We can talk about whether there's an archetype that applies to this. But we want to diagnose the overall system behavior. And we want to address those things uh, and remember that church systems behave in counterintuitive ways. They do, not, they do not operate according to common sense. They do not operate according to logic. They are not mathematical. They operate in counterintuitive ways, and those are things you've constantly got to remember because what you're expecting to happen very often is not what's going to happen. So when we identify possible interventions, uh, we want to remember that brainstorming is important. Um, you can review generic interventions, the things that we've just talked about, and we'll use those things in a, in a few minutes to look at some examples of potential interventions. The systems thinking tools that you have learned are designed to help you think about systems in a way that can help you improve the performance, but good ideas can come from people that don't have systems training, but we need to be able to think and, and to apply those things in systemic ways. Um, it's also wise of systems leaders to consider the proposals that others have, have suggested. Remember, it's a group effort. It's not just one person. The more input you get from people in the system, the better you will be, and, and probably the greater the opportunities to find an appropriate intervention will be. When we're talking about identifying interventions, remember that every intervention should be subject to a few quality control questions, such as, will it achieve the desired result? Is this gonna to contribute to the desired result? What unintended consequences or what resistance might this result, might this result in, might it, might it generate? Refine the intervention and evaluate it again until the probability of achieving results is reasonably high and the chances of unintended consequences have been significantly reduced. And so that takes time. It takes looking at it again and again and think about unintended consequences. Think about what it will accomplish so you can refine your potential intervention.
You want to make sure that you eliminate as much as possible unintended consequences and increase the likelihood of accomplishing the result. Let's talk a little bit about delays. Uh, a delay is a is a, a delay in time and space that between in, between one action and a result. So we want to increase spiritual maturity in the church, and so we increase our training in spiritual disciplines. Well, it's going to take time before you see results in that. You can start training and, and helping people with uh, spiritual disciplines, but you won't see results for some time. It, it'll be months and months, maybe even years, before you start seeing significant results. So that's a delay. It doesn't happen immediately. And as a matter of fact, in church, almost nothing happens immediately. There's, there's always some kind of delay between positive uh, long-term change. So remember that shorter delays are not always better. When you see a delay, it may be that your, your immediate thinking is, well, we need, to, we need to decrease that delay. That's not necessarily the case because sometimes decreased delays actually make the system work in a, in a more negative way. A delay in a feedback process is critical relative to the rates of change in the system. Um, just remember that the feedback loop that you have identified is controlling something. And if you decrease that delay, you throw that feedback loop out of, uh, out of balance. Delays that are too short can cause an overreaction, kind of an, a chasing your tail oscillation, and you don't want to create that in your system. Overly long delays in a system with a threshold, a danger point, a range past which irreversible damage can concur, can occur, will solve, will create a more problems in your in your system. Um, you you can shorten a delay, you can lengthen a delay, but understand what the results are going to be when you shorten or lengthen your delays. Negative feedback loops. Um, the strength of a negative feedback loop is its ability to keep its appointed variable at or near a goal. Okay, It depends on a combination of all the variables and the links that are in the system, but the strength of the negative feedback loop is important relative to the impact it's designed to correct. If the impact increases in strength, the feedbacks have to be strengthened too. Positive feedback loops are sources of growth, explosion, erosion, and collapse in systems. A system with an unchecked positive loop will ultimately destroy itself. Um, for example, a church can continually grow, 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 grow because there are, there are other factors that are impacting that growth. You need ministers, you need ministries, you need programming, you need spiritual resources. And unchecked positive growth is, an, is ultimately going to destroy the system. Uh, so just remember that positive loops are good. They are the source of growth, but they can't be unchecked. That's why balancing loops are important. Uh, reducing the gain around a positive loop, in other words, slowing the growth, is usually a more powerful leverage point than strengthening negative loops. That's a key point. You want to reduce the gain around a positive loop. So work with the positive loops rather than strengthening negative loops most often. Many positive feedback loops in society reward the winners of competition with the resources to win even bigger next time, and that's called success of the successful. For example, one of the reasons that uh, congregational care in the church is so powerful and so strong is because there is a shorter delay. People are satisfied when they get another Bible study or another visitation or there's another program that pays attention to them. That then increases the church budget for those things in the next time and those things that take longer like evangelism and outreach and, and community ministry, they don't have the quick results. And so people don't see those and so congregational care 
congregational focused ministries get more money and the outreach and the evangelism and the ministry to the community gets less money. So that's increasing the success to the one that has the quick response or the quick win and decreasing the one to that has a slower response. Success to the successful. Not good, but very common in churches. Information flows. Um, so for example, missing feedback is one of the most common causes of system malfunction. What that means is that your system is operating and every system is giving off feedback, but we're missing it. We're not getting that information. Um, for example, you've started a new small group, uh, small group ministry and the people in the small group are talking about it, but you're not hearing what their concerns are. They're not satisfied, but that's not coming to you. That's an example of how missing feedback will uh, impact the system. Information flow is not a parameter adjustment. It's not strengthening or weakening an existing loop. It's always a new loop. It's increasing, it, it's increasing the number of, of information loops. It's increasing the, the amount of opportunities or venues for information. And it delivers that information to a place where it wasn't going before and therefore causing people to behave differently. Again, the new, uh, the new small group ministry where the minister wasn't getting the feedback, well, the minister probably needs to talk to a small group leaders or those who are in charge of that ministry and say, please, let's have a feedback session. Let's create a feedback loop so I'm hearing what the concerns, what the positive, what the negatives are about this new ministry. That's creating a new feedback loop. Another example of uh, information flows are uh, web-based video that's available for churches or social media apps. Those are information flows, all kinds of information flows. And, and in a church, information flows are one of the primary interventions because you probably have heard people complain about communication in churches. Well, there's something to be said for that. Information flows are one of the most important uh, interventions in a church. What about the rules of the system? Well, the rules of a system define the scope, the boundaries, and the degree of freedom. For example, you know, thou shalt not kill, that's a boundary. That's, that, that says you can't go outside of this. Um, the rules of a system list the laws, the punishments, the incentives, and the informal social agreements um, that are progressively weaker. Um, laws, punishments, incentives, informal social agreements are, are weaker than laws. Incentives are weaker than laws. Um, in a church, your rules of the system are your constitution, bylaws, guiding principles, the polity of your denomination. Those are the rules of your system. And rules are high leverage points. If you can change the rules, you've got power over the system. So if you want to understand the deepest malfunction of system, pay attention to the rules and who has power over those rules. Really important when you're talking about changing bylaws, you're talking about one of the most powerful interventions in a system. Changing the constitution, powerful intervention, and those people who have the power to change them. That's important in a church. The goals of the system are like your mission statement, your vision statement. Um, their system goals are not necessarily what we think of. They're not uh, much deducible from what anybody says as from what the system does. The goals of the system are driven by system behavior. So like survival, many systems are simply surviving. And there are churches that the goal of the church is merely to survive. It's not to maximize its ministry. It's not to flourish, it's to survive. Uh, resilience is one of the goals of the system. <coughs> uh, differentiation can be a goal of the system. Evolution are system level goals, uh, like corporation systems or cancer cell systems. 
Identifying the actual goals of a church system can be painful and or threatening, so wise leadership is necessary. For example, a church that prides itself on its outreach ministry, but at the end of the year you find we've only seen one person come to Christ in this whole year, but we put lots of money, lots of effort into doing that, <coughs> but all of that money and effort was focused on only a couple individuals. And so the goal of the system isn't really being met. The goal of the system is to have the pride of saying that we are big on outreach and evangelism. The goals of the system are rarely written in the mission system, in the mission statement. And replacing a leader with power over those goals is a high leverage intervention, but it has to be used with lots of caution. Using the power over the rules of the system is one of the most important things to understand. Who has power over those who has control of the rules of the system or the, excuse me, the goals of the system is really important. And when we talk about mission statements, when we talk about vision statements, those are the goals of the system, but they might not be the real goals. They're the stated goals, but the real goals of the system. And that's where it's important to think about, you know, what are the payoffs in this system? Because very often the payoffs in the system are related to the real goals of the system. In a church, it is possible that the goal of the system really is to be as comfortable as possible. In a church, one of the goals of the system can be to have the minister do as much as possible. In a church, one of the goals of the system can be to have a great experience on Sunday and do nothing the rest of the week. Those are real goals of real systems, and you need to be able to say those. You need to be able to address those and recognize those honestly and forthrightly. But it takes wisdom to do that. So what's a strategy that would be work that would be most powerful? Well, that's changing a mindset or a paradigm. In other words, addressing mental models. You know, for an individual, all it takes to change our mental model is just a click of a new idea or a new understanding. You know, the scales that fall from our eyes, that, that changes our entire outlook. It's a new way of seeing. But when we're talking about a church system, it doesn't work that way. It's not that fast. An entire church system uh, requires more effort for it to adopt a new mental model. And how church leaders do that is by emphasizing the anomalies, those things that are not the way they should be, the failures of the old paradigm or the old mental model. You keep saying louder and louder with assurance from this new perspective that this is the way we need to walk in this so that they can see that this new way is different than the old paradigm so that people can say, ah, I see, I need to, I need to update my understanding of this. And when we're talking about changing mental models, we want to make sure that we don't waste time with reactionaries, but that we work with the people who are active change agents, who are interested in seeing the church grow and flourish. Um, and then that will help us to deal with that vast middle ground of people who are open-minded. And of course, that's uh, the theory of diffusion of innovation. And it's very true. Don't waste your time with, with reactionaries or those who are laggards who don't ever want to change anything. Work with the people who are interested, and then that will diffuse through that vast middle ground of people who are more open-minded to healthy growth. So in a church, let's just cut to the chase. The most uh, high power interventions in a church are dealing with reinforcing loops, delays, information flows, the rules of the system, which are how the system works, and the goals of the system, which is why the system works. Okay, Those are the highest leverage interventions that you can accomplish. So now let's apply those generic interventions to real system problems. 
In Exodus 18, Moses is confronted by his father-in-law Jethro, and Jethro asks questions, and he says, what you're doing is not good, Moses, because there was a dispute. There's a dispute, and the people come to Moses to have those disputes adjudicated. And Moses says, well, I am the one. The people come to me. When his father-in-law asked, Moses says, well, people come to me. God has said, I am the one who needs to adjudicate these. And so Moses, as the disputes increase, and the entire, uh, entire community of Israel, they all come to Moses. And Moses says, well, I need to adjudicate all of these. And so his ministry time keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. And so he thinks that as he spends more time adjudicating, that that will decrease the innocence of disputes. But it doesn't. What's actually happening is that as Moses' ministry time increases, the workload increases and the stress increases. And as that increases, the disputes actually increase. Why? Well, because human beings are naturally increasing their disputes, but Moses' capacity is decreasing. And so the workload and stress are actually increasing the disputes, not decreasing them. So where are potential leverage points in this? Well, number one is recognizing that Moses' mental model is that he has to do all of the work himself. Then recognizing that as he has that mental model, that increases his workload and stress. So what can we do? Well, in this case, we could deal with negative feedback loops. We could deal with the rules of the system, the goals of the system, the mindset, the paradigm, or the mental models. So what did Jethro recommend? Here's what Jethro recommended. Moses' ministry time was dealt with by delegation. So part of that was a mental model of Moses recognizing that he needed to do all of the important uh, adjudication, but to all of the others, he could delegate those to trusted men who were uh, wise and full of the Holy Spirit. Um, so he delegated, and that actually decreased the number of disputes that Moses had to deal with. But the other thing that happened is by delegating, the workload and stress decreased, which allowed Moses to spend more time teaching, which ultimately would also de decrease the disputes. So Jethro suggested to Moses that he add a link at B1, and he did, that he add a loop at B2, the teaching, which he did, and that, re that reduced the negative feedback on, on R3, the workload and stress. Because Jethro said, you, you're to teach them. Moses, you said you're to teach them, but you're spending so much time adjudicating, you're not teaching. So by delegating, that allowed him to decrease the disputes by sharing the workload, but it also allowed him to spend more time teaching, which, although it would take time, would ultimately decrease the number of disputes that would have to be dealt with overall. So that is a powerful system intervention that we see in Exodus 18 with, Joseph, with Jethro and Moses. Here's a real life example. We have churches that say, we don't have enough youth. We don't have enough youth. We look around and we're all, we're all 55 or 65 and older. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, in a church system, there's always a uh, a long-term solution, a more fundamental solution, and that would be that the congregation would be involved in ministering to youth because the more congregational members are involved in youth ministry, the more youth we'll attract. But what happens most often in, in churches is that we see that we don't have enough youth, and so we put all of the effort into youth ministry. Very often we'll hire a youth worker and they're responsible for all of it. It may be one, two, it may be volunteers, it may be somebody that they hire, but the youth minister gets saddled with all of that responsibility. And so the congregation doesn't pay any attention because all of the effort has been put into this, that if we just have a youth minister to do all of this for us, then we should start seeing more youth in our church. Well, the problem is this. When we do that, that mindset, 
we we have a youth worker but they take on all of the responsibility and the congregation has a decreased sense that the congregation needs to be involved because we've hired a youth worker that's their job that's not our job so they should be doing this so we don't have any responsibility to minister to youth that's a problem and that is a common system issue that we see in churches so what can we do well we can deal with the delays, the information flows, the rules, the goals, and the mindset or the mental models. Here is one way of dealing with that. We recognize that expecting a youth minister or youth ministry group to handle all of that is probably not wise. So we could, we could focus more on the fundamental or the more biblical solution, and that is let's decrease that delay by equipping the congregation for youth ministry by by using a third party equipping person or group in the short term which in the long term will increase our ability for the congregation to be involved in youth in youth ministry which will which will bring more youth into the church then also the youth ministry people that we have within the church will be able to be more effective in their ministry because they had more congregation members involved. And that then can deal with the, with the need to equip the entire congregation for youth ministry. And the youth ministry worker won't just be doing Bible studies and events and cookouts and, and camp outs for youth, but they'll also then be equipping the congregation to help with the youth ministry. And so that shortage will uh, be dealt with. Here's another one. Uh, I call this the helicopter ministry approach. Congregational maturity is low and there is a biblical way, a long-term, more fundamental solution, and that is biblical teaching and biblical equipping. The problem is that takes time. That is not quick. So if we want to increase congregational maturity, one other thing we could do is, well, we'll just have the pastor do it all. We won't, we won't put the, res the responsibility on ourselves. Pastor, it's kind of your job to, to do all of this for us. And here's what happens. When that's true, all kinds of helicopter pastors, just like helicopter parents, you know, they're constantly hovering to make sure that everything is handled. Well, that covers over the real need for the congregation to grow up and mature. But the other thing that happens is that the pastor gets a lot of affirmation for his personal attention to all of the people in the congregation. And what does that do? Well, it decreases the congregation's sense that we need good teaching and equipping so that we can grow up into Christ. We really appreciate the fact that our pastor is always there for us when we need him. He's always there to pray for us. He's always there to explain the Bible to us. He's always there to help us in worship. We really just rely on him. And oh, we'll tell him how great he is. We'll give him gifts at, at, uh, at Christmas. We'll, we'll make sure he feels warm and loved on Pastor Appreciation Month. But we don't need more teaching and equipping. Well, that's wrong. Actually, that's exactly what they need. And the pastor needs to recognize that being a hovering helicopter pastor is being a disservice to the congregation. So what can we do? What would you do? Would you deal with the delays, the negative feedback loops, the positive feedback loops? Would you deal with information flows, rules of the system, goals of the system, mindset? What would you do? Well, here is one thing we could do. We could focus on decreasing the delay between teaching and equipping in some ways. One way we can do that is for, rather than the pastor be a helicopter minister, he could be an apprenticing minister where he apprentices a group who will become the teachers and equippers of ministry. But of course, to do that, you have to engage in that biblical equipping and teaching of the group, the, the apprenticing of the group. Uh, spiritual giftedness is important here. We need to understand those things. The other thing is that the minister could help the congregation understand that the mental model 
that a pastor is to be a helicopter or somebody who hovers over everyone is unhealthy and unbiblical, it would be very important for that to happen. The other thing that we need to recognize is that the pastoral affirmation that decreases the sense of need for teaching and equipping has to be dealt with. And that would be a case where the other leaders of the church would want to intervene on that and not decrease pastoral affirmation, but make pastoral affirmation based on teaching and equipping, not just being there to pray for, teach, and do all of those things that the congregation wants them to do. There are a lot of different ways to do this, and one of the other ways to do that would be to change the rules of the system and to change the goals of the system. But that requires uh, those who are in charge of those things to make the changes. But that is an intervention that we could make. So take a moment to talk about what you would do with that system and why you would do it. So in a systems thinking process, as we wrap this up, just remember that as we're going to intervene, we want to define the problem and issue very carefully. We want to use the tools. We want to use the systems iceberg. We want to model it with especially the connection circle. And remember that when you're going to intervene, you need to remember that systems in a church are counterintuitive. You have to apply that. You have to assess where those counterintuitive behaviors are occurring and take those into account. And then the four questions that you always want to ask is what's happening? Make sure that you tell the story. Make sure that you understand clearly what's really happening. And then you want to graph what has been happening. Why, despite our best efforts, do we uh, not, are we not able to solve this problem or are we not able to keep missing, or why do we keep missing deadlines? Um, identify structural explanations. Remember, structure is the connections between the factors. What are the key causes and consequences of that pattern? How do our responses actually cause more problems? And then finally, how can we improve system performance? Is the system accomplishing a purpose other than what we want? Are our beliefs and values causing that situation to persist? And in a church, very, very common that it's our beliefs and our values, our mental models are actually driving the system. It's nothing else. So the three effective keys to systems thinking, number one, thinking. 90% of the work in systems thinking is just thinking. It's stepping back and thinking about what's happening. It's applying all of those rules that we've talked about. And then it's experimenting. You know, if you work on paper before you try to implement anything, there's no bad idea. Try things out. Look at how that would work on paper. Anticipate what would happen. What would be those consequences that we intend, but what would also be the consequences that we wouldn't intend? Try to identify those so we can minimize those and maximize the productive uh, results. And then we want to refine and define. The more time you spend defining what is and refining what you're trying to implement, the more powerful it will be. So as we wrap this up, I know that's a lot of information, but as you work through it, you'll see that um, the systems thinking is really about paying attention to what's happening. It's about thinking through why things really work the way they work and understanding what's really driving that system. And as you do that, you will find that you can, you can make high power, lever high leverage, high power interventions that will bring change, positive change to your church system. So, Thank you so much for your interest. Thank you so much for your attention. And thank you for investing in doing good things for your church with systems thinking. God bless you and may you see success and may you see wonderful spirit-led change as you implement these things in your church. Thanks. I'm Dr. John Messer. Bye.